Good morning. Am I on, Taylor? I usually don't need a microphone, but Taylor said I needed one, so here we go. Um, I needed a, a comic relief this morning, and Keegan uh, uh, supplied it to me. Keegan's my friend over here on my left, and he came up to me and says, Are you in security now? He saw the thing in my ear, <laughs> and I said, I'm the last guy you want for security. I don't, I don't lock my car. I don't lock my house. That would be like the fox guarding the hen house if you had me in security. You don't want me in security. But I do appreciate the security people. I really do. Uh, I want to take a poll this morning. Don't be embarrassed, but this is to help me because I've got our text in three different versions, and I've always wanted to do this. So I want you to raise your hand and tell me what version you use. So if you use the NASB, raise your hand. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Good. That's, I get an idea. If you use the ESV, raise your hand. Wow. It's about, it's about equal. And if you're like me and you use the New King James, raise your hand. Oh, I got some. Some that use what I use. That's great. Uh, well, the NASB, and we're like evenly divided. And then uh, the New King James comes in a sad third. So I think what I'll do this morning is I'm going to read our text out of the NASB. And maybe next time if I ever do this again, I'll do it out of the ESV. But uh, it's kind of interesting. We live in a, in a culture where everybody uses a different version. Sometimes it's hard to follow the reading. In fact, I don't even follow the reading anymore. I just try to listen because I can't, I can't coordinate what the guy's saying and I'm reading. So, but I am going to read out of the uh, NASB. And so our text this morning is Mark chapter 5. By the, name, by the way, if you don't know me, my name's Rick, and I have one credential. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and that's it. That's the only credential I have for being up here. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, and we'll read all the way through verse 43. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Let's read together. <clears throat> when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he stayed by the seashore. And one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came and upon seeing him fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. And while he was still speaking, the people came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher further? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion. 
and people loudly weeping and wailing. And after entering, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But putting them all outside, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was in bed. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kume, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders that no one was to know about this, and he told them to have something given to her to eat. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we read these stories and sometimes they're all too familiar. And we forget that this really, really happened. That you walked upon the, this sod called earth, just like we do, lived a perfect life, performed miracle after miracle after miracle, raised people from the dead, cleansed the unclean, helped the deaf to hear and the blind to see. Sometimes we just make that all too common but you did all of these things. You were the Son of God, and you're the Savior of sinners. And this morning, Father, we're going to come face to face, I pray by your word, with this Savior of sinners. Oh, Lord, may anyone here that may have walked in and I'm not sure or have rejected or think they're believers but have never been healed by the Son of God, please use your word this morning to pierce their hearts asunder, the soul from the spirit, the joints from the marrow. Make it the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of their heart. Save sinners today, God, and encourage those who are doubting those who are struggling in their faith, and there are many of those among us as well. Dear God, I beg you this morning, I have no power in and of myself, no eloquence, no intellect, no giftedness. The power is in your word. Use it this morning to save those that need to be saved, whether they are indeed 90 or 9. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at our text this morning. I'm going to stick as close to the text as I can, because that's all I know. I'm going to make it only a two-part sermon, but the second part will have five subdivisions, so we'll see if we get through this. The first... Oh, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the Jairus story. I thought perhaps that I could do that. Then I was thinking logically and realistically and said, there's no way unless you want to be here till 1 o'clock. And so maybe at some other point, somebody else, maybe Robert, will preach Jairus for us. I'd love to hear that. But this morning, I'm going to concentrate solely and strictly on the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. Now, this is an interesting story, as you know, because it's two miracles for the price of one. Jesus is on his way to heal the daughter of a synagogue official, and as he's going, and as he's walking, this is probably up near Capernaum, Jesus is stopped cold in his tracks by a woman that had no reputation whatsoever. And so I've entitled this sermon, What Stops Jesus in His Tracks? That's the question I want to ask you this morning. What is it that stops Jesus and looks and thinks about what you're saying or doing. The Revelation in chapter 1 and also chapter 2, verse 1 says, Jesus walks among the candlesticks of his church. Do you realize that Jesus Christ is here this morning? By his Spirit, Jesus is here. And he's walking up and down the aisles, looking to see what he should stop for. I wonder what he does want to stop for. 
Is he stopping for great intellectual debates? Spiritual acumen? Is he stopping because we are really good singers, or is he stopping because we have really nice families? Is he stopping because we feel about things very deeply or don't feel about things at all? I wonder what Jesus would stop for if he was wandering up and down the hallways of this congregation this morning. Well, I tell you what Jesus would stop for because it's in the text. What Jesus will stop for is a heart of desperation that wants to touch him by faith and be healed. That's the whole sermon right there. What Jesus stops for is when somebody with a desperate heart wants to touch the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and be healed. I wonder if I look out this morning, if there are not some who are waiting and saying, I want that. I've never actually called out to the Lord Jesus Christ to be healed for various and sundry reasons. What causes the Lord Jesus Christ to stop dead in his tracks? Not a lot. But that. That he'll stop for. And so, Jesus is walking down this dusty road of Palestine, probably again in the northern parts in Galilee, probably near Capernaum. And this woman comes up to him. And I want to look this morning at the faith that this woman had. Because it was that faith that caused Jesus to stop. It was that faith that caused Jesus to stop. So the question you have to be asking in your mind this morning is what kind of faith was that? You get that and you know what salvation is. And then you know what to do if you need to be saved. Or if you need to have your assurance bolstered because you're not really sure you've ever believed the right way. And we have all that spectrum of doubters and questioners and so on in this room this morning. So what I want to do in the second point is simply to say what kind of faith stops Jesus dead in his tracks? The first one, and they're all going to be C's, I made it easy for you. Conquering faith. A conquering faith. A true faith is a faith that will leap over any wall, jump over any ditch, run through any army, and go as fast as possible to get to the object of its desire. That's what this woman had. I want you to think for a moment what she had to overcome to go to Jesus that day on that road in Galilee. First, she was a woman. In that culture, women didn't wander around by themselves unless they had something really, really important they had to do. Different culture then than we have today. Women just weren't walking around without men or children with her. She's alone. And she comes up to Jesus. Not only is she alone, but she is of a mild or reserved or frightened personality. We see that later on. She's not a go-getter by any means. She's somebody that stands back and watches. She's reticent to even come to Jesus in the first place. She's of a timid personality. Thirdly, she's weak. Notice in the text that it says she'd had an issue of blood for 12 years. 
See, I'm 90. That would put me from 78 to 90. I would have been bleeding. Can you imagine what I would feel like? Some of you ladies probably understand that more than the men. What does that feel like to be constantly bleeding? Well, obviously, it means you're going to be very, very weak. How she got to Jesus at all is a mystery. But she did. Because faith overcomes. You want Jesus this morning, you will have to have a faith that says, I will break through anything to get to him. Fourthly, and most importantly, she was unclean. Now again, we have no knowledge of that. This is not a cultural thing with us, but certainly was a cultural thing with the Jews. If you go back to uh, the book of Leviticus, chapter 15, and verse 25 and following, I'll read those words for you. Let me read verse 7 first out of Leviticus chapter 15. And whoever touches the body of the one with a discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean till evening. So if you have any kind of discharge of any fluid from your body, I'm getting a little bit graphic here and I don't want to, then you are considered in that culture unclean. Nobody can touch you. You can't be around anybody. If you sleep in a bed and someone else sleeps in that bed, they're unclean. So whatever you touch and someone else touches, you're all unclean. This is very serious in the Jewish economy. And then it goes on in verse 15. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of a menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she, she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed in which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. But if she was cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest to the entrance of the, of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. This woman had no right to be out wandering around in the crowd unclean. And yet faith will always overcome. That's the point. Another thing to remember is that she was seeing Jesus walking swiftly down the road to heal the daughter of a big shot. Now, in that day, the temple authority or uh, the, the temple manager, whatever you want to call him, uh, I'm sorry, the synagogue authority, the synagogue manager, whatever you want to call him, was a very important person in the days of Israel. Now, Jesus was an up-and-coming rabbi. This is early in his ministry, right? And really, to get, to get in good with the authorities, and one of the authorities comes up to you and says, hey, my daughter is sick, can you go heal her? I would think that would be a priority in your ministry, after all, we always want to hobnob with the important people, don't we? And so she knew this. She knew that Jesus was on his way to heal a nobleman's, a synagogue ruler's daughter. Why would he even want to take time to stop for her? But he does. Because faith always conquers. Faith always conquers. Do you, have, do you have a conquering faith? It says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5, who is it that overcomes? Whoever comes to the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the conquering faith. 
Secondly, we see in the text that the woman had a faith that was convincing, or a faith that convinced. It was a convinced faith. She was convinced that Jesus Christ was able to heal her. You will never come to Jesus Christ unless you know that he and he alone can heal. Where do I get that? It's right in the text. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd, this is verse 27, and touched his cloak, for she had been saying to herself, she's preaching to herself, what is she preaching? If I just touch his garments, I will get well. He, she was convinced that Jesus Christ could heal her. Notice that in that statement, there is a, an if clause, a conditional clause, and, but then there is a, a definite clause, an indicative clause. If I can touch his garments, that's not yet been proven, that yet has not yet been accomplished, but if I can touch his garments, what will be the result? I will get well. Faith knows that Jesus Christ is the only hope. Anyone that's ever been saved in this room, myself included, have been saved because we knew that Jesus Christ could heal. Now, how did she know? Look at verse 27 in the beginning. After hearing about Jesus. After hearing about Jesus. The only testimony that she had was through the ears. She had heard about Jesus. Now, the previous story to this is Jesus casting out legion from that demoniac um, young man and sending all the, the demons into the swine who threw themselves over a cliff. And it says early on in chapter 5, In verse 14, so those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. The word is getting around. Jesus is the healer. He might be the prophet that is to come. And this lady evidently had heard about this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You will never get saved unless you can hear about Jesus Christ. She was convinced, for she said, I will get well. She was convinced that Jesus could heal her because she had heard about Jesus. You don't come to Jesus because you feel something in your belly. You don't come to Jesus based on some obscure facts about some guy somewhere that did something. You come to Jesus when you are convinced by testimony, by witness, that he is the Christ and that he can save sinners. Proof of that, 1 John chapter 1, and I'll read it for you. 1 John chapter 1, how does John begin his epistle? He says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we, we the apostles have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and which our hands have handled the word of life. Me, John, I saw Jesus. I touched Jesus. I heard Jesus. And I'm now telling you, that everything about him is true. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, you see, saying it over and over again, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father 
and with His Son, Jesus Christ. How are you going to get saved? How are you going to bolster your faith? By listening and hearing and touching and smelling Jesus Christ. Look at the end of the book. He ends it the way he begins it. And we, have, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and that we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. You're saved only by hearing the testimony of Jesus. Salvation doesn't come in the gut. Doesn't come in the feelings. Doesn't come in the suppositions. Doesn't come in the high fluting theology. It comes knowing who Jesus Christ is and believing every word written about him. Do you believe this book? If you don't believe this book, I don't know how in the world you could be saved. So I read it. It tells us more and more and more and more about Jesus Christ. And we say, yes, yes, yes. It's a faith that convinces us. Are you convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you convinced in his death, his burial, and his resurrection? Paul said the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through through 3. Of foremost importance. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again from the dead. We have a religion that's based in history. Never forget that. You know, if, if, if Gautama Buddha doesn't exist, the Buddha, Buddha still goes on. If Joseph Smith turns to be a fraud, the Mormons still go on. If Muhammad is a fraud, Islam continues forward. If Jesus Christ is not who he said he is, we're done. Go home. Go to the bar. Do whatever you want to do. Don't be here. Be a waste of time. Jesus Christ died. He was buried, and he rose again from the dead. Do you believe that? Do you? It's the only only thing we got. Folks, that's the only thing we got. That's all we need. That's all we need. She was convinced by just mere testimony. How shall they hear if, they don't, if there's not a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? We need to be telling people about Jesus Christ. Say, what's evangelism? Mike, it's very simple, isn't it? You tell people about Jesus. Right, Logan? You tell people about Jesus Christ, right? Is there anything more to it than that? No, nothing more. We can debate evolution all day long. They ain't going to do a what a good. Sometimes you have to do that to knock down their arguments, but that's not what's going to save them. All right. So it was a conquering faith. It was a faith that was convinced. <laughs> and then verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. It's a connecting faith. What do you mean by a connecting faith, Rick? What, did you have to force that C in there? I guess maybe I did. So, so, so I'll explain what I mean. A connecting faith. You see, not everybody that touches Jesus gets healed. This is important. There's a lot of people in this room that have touched Jesus. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I've heard about Jesus. I go to church. I might even read the Bible once in a while. I will tell people at work that I know Jesus. You know how many people touched Jesus in this text? I don't know, but I bet you it was hundreds that touched Jesus. Because it says that he was in a throng. He was in a crowd. You know, they didn't have the social distancing back then, right? When people were gathering around you, there were, I mean, you're bumping shoulders and elbows and people are hitting your head and hitting you in the leg and all this. I mean, they were thronged around Jesus. Everybody was touching Jesus. 
one person is healed. Think about that. Oh, I've touched Jesus, but are you healed? Have you touched him with a connectivity? Well, how do I know? How do I know I've actually touched Jesus the right way? Oh, you know, of course, in Acts 8, you've got Simon Magus. He said he believed. You know, in John 6, the disciples were all gathered around Jesus as long as he's feeding them. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, we're his disciples. John 6, 66, and from that moment on, many of them turned away and walked with him no more. And the Bible were filled with people that believe, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That doesn't mean anything. Do you have a faith that actually connects with Jesus Christ? How do you know? Well, look at the text. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, verse 29, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? There was a connection. It doesn't say the connection was strong, because she touched his garment. That's not a strong connection. I don't know about you, I have a vacuum cleaner, and half the time I run over the cord, and uh, you know, the, 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 the cord has got all these chips in it, you see the wires hanging out and stuff, but guess what? As long as the wires are still in intact, I can plug that thing in and it still runs. It might be the weakest connection in the world, but as long as there's power in the plug, it's okay. She was healed because of two things in the text. She gave to Jesus her uncleanness. When you come to Jesus by faith, all you tell him is one thing. Now, look at me, I got a degree, or I'm kind of a nice guy and I need a hand up. No, you say, I am unclean completely and totally and comprehensively, and I need you, God, to cleanse me up. Here, take it. Take my uncleanness. Take all my foulness. Take my filth. Take everything about me. And Jesus, in turn, gives you something. There's a connection. And what's that? Well, we know what that is. He gives you himself. He gives you his righteousness. He takes your uncleanness. He gives you his righteousness. What kind of deal is that, huh? When you touch Jesus by faith, you give him all your garbage, and he gives you all his gold. That happened to me many years ago. Why am I even here? Because Jesus took my junk and gave me of himself. That's saving faith. There's a certain way to receive Jesus Christ. You kids, there's a way not to receive him. You don't receive him because, oh, I'm a good little kid, and I come to church with my mommy and daddy, and I'm doing good, and everything's great. Kids, are you listening? That doesn't save you. What saves you is when you say, I am foul. My parents don't even know half the truth of what goes on through my mind, and what do I strive for in my life? And you go to Jesus, and you say, here, Jesus, you take all this. And he says, I give you my righteousness. Imagine eight-year-old daughter. Are you got any eight-year-old daughters in here today? I teach the, what, third and fourth grade? What is it, Logan? Something like that. I love those kids. I didn't get to teach them today because Joe Murphy bumped me out, but that's okay. I forgive Joe. Let's say you're an eight-year-old girl. You, you, there's a dress that you see at, just say, na name whatever store. I don't go shopping. I have no idea. Every time you're with your mom and you see that dress, and you tug your mom's coattail, and you say, Mom, I love that dress. Look at that beautiful dress. I want that dress. Your mom says, no, not now, sweetheart. Maybe another time, whatever. And the next time you go to the store, you're tugging on her again. Mom, I really love that dress. It's so pretty. And she says, no, not, not yet, sweetheart. And then the third time and the fourth time, and you touch that dress in the store, but 
It's just not a real touch. It's like, oh, I would like to have this, but I know it doesn't belong to me. And then one day your birthday comes, and you see that gift that's wrapped up on, on, the, on the kitchen table. And your mom says, happy birthday, sweetie. Open that gift, and there it is, and you know what it is. It's that dress. Now, when you touch that package, that gift, is it the same as when you touch the dress in the store? No. Now you're taking it and saying, it's mine. I love this. Give me all I love. it. Thank you, mom. Thank you for this dress. That's the kind of touch that you must have if you're going to be saved. You don't say, it's someone else's Jesus, and I'll touch him just so I can get by in the family. Or I can keep peace with my neighbors or people in the church. They all should know that I have something to do with Jesus after all. Now, you've taken that gift that's yours, and nobody else is going to take it from you. That's what the lady here is doing. I want you to see another thing. It's not the strength of her grip. That doesn't matter. It was the object of her grip. See the difference? You can touch Jesus lightly by his garment, or you can take him and you can give him a big old hug and grab him and never let go. And both of those touches will save you if you're receiving what he has to give you. You might be weak this morning. I'm weak. You say, I don't know if I can touch Jesus like so-and-so in the church, one of the elders or whoever. Yeah, you probably can't. But can you touch him at all? That's the question. Are you willing to say, I'm nothing and he's everything and I just want to touch his garment? I don't know if I can have Jesus, but if I just touch him, he'll give me his, his self. It's a, it's a connecting faith. It's also a conflicted well, it has to be a little bad news in the sermon, right? Conflicted faith. Actually, this is the best news of all. I know people from the young disciples, and probably some of you, that just struggle with their faith. I struggle with my faith. I do. It's hard to believe something you've never seen. I've heard the testimony of Jesus a thousand times, but... Is it really true? What does it mean by conflicted faith? I want you to notice in the text that she touches Jesus with that touch of faith. And then he looks around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling. Stop right there. Fearing and trembling. Well, Rick, I thought you said she had a, a, a very strong faith. Uh, a faith that, it was, that, that she was convinced of because she heard about Jesus. Yes, I did say that. And I meant that. But why then is she fearing and trembling? Now, I want you all to listen, especially if you struggle with your faith. There's a difference between being convinced that Jesus is the Christ and being convinced that you're worthy of touching Jesus. Two different things. One is a matter of salvation. One is a matter of assurance. I am sure that the, when the woman touched, she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus could save. That's a given in the text. What she wasn't sure about was, am I worthy enough to touch Jesus? After all, I'm a woman. I'm weak. I'm polluted. I bet half the people in this room Struggle with that. I know for myself. I know Jesus is the Christ. I know he rose again from the dead. But am I worthy of him? The obvious answer is no. Some of you that struggle with your faith need to hear this. If you know that Jesus is the Christ and you have touched him, you are worthy. Worthy because his worthiness, not your own. 
Imagine if you're adopted. We have some adopted kids here. Maybe you have been adopted. Maybe you're thinking of adopting. Think about the adoption, the child that comes into the family. The adopted one sees the papers, sees the judge's stamp, sees all the orders. Everything's legal. You now belong to this family. Nothing can change that. Then the child says, I belong to the family. I see the adoption papers signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, But am I really worthy of this family? I'm a little bit different than the rest of the kids. I don't look like them, maybe. Maybe I got a different skin color. Am I really worthy of being in this family? And then dad goes back into the, the, the file room and whips out the adoption papers and says, yes, you do belong. Look at this. Oh, but dad, I don't feel worthy. No, look at the papers. We love you. You're part of this family. You see, that's what faith is. You are sure you belong to Christ because he says so, but you doubt. Why? Because you're looking at yourself. I do that all the time. Rather than looking outside myself to the worthiness of Jesus Christ. If you've touched his garment, my friend, you're saved. If you've come to him and said, I got all this garbage, here it is, and he gives you of his righteousness, you are saved. Some of you today don't know that. Lord, please show them. Lastly, it's a confessing faith. It says there in verse 33 in the second part, the woman fearing and trembling, where did what happened to her came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Remember Jesus had said, who touched me? I mean, the most ridiculous question it seemed in all the world. Who, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. No, who touched me? Because I'm stopping for that one that just touched me. What do you mean? Who do you mean who touched you? We're all touched. Then he looks around. He sees this woman slinking down, trying to exit the crowd as fast as possible. And he says, she touched me. That one right there. And what does she do? Aware of what happened to her, she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Faith cannot be hid, my friend. Can't be hid. If you really believe in Jesus Christ, that faith will come out. Now I know, sometimes you get saved and You're in difficult circumstances, family or job or whatever. And you say, I can't really tell anybody just yet. I just got saved. But it will come out. Joseph of Marathia, I don't know how many council meetings he went to believing in Jesus. But when Jesus was on that cross and somebody needed to come and take his body, he finally said, I have to admit that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he went and he got that body. It will come out. Have you confessed Jesus Christ? If you confess with your mouth with the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I don't know where this thing is, but you still hear me, Taylor? Yeah, okay. I love these contraptions, you can tell. I'm real technologically advanced if you don't know me. No, really. Have you confessed your faith in Jesus Christ? I want to propose to you that if you are saved, you will confess Jesus Christ. Because it cannot be stopped. You go with your parents to Yellowstone, and your dad says, hey, Junior, I'm going to go sit on Old Faithful, and I'm going to stop the geyser. (laughs) Well, that would be a short test, wouldn't it? 
You'd be, uh, you'd be uh, cooked to a uh, bacon. But anyway, uh, the point is, <laughs> the point is, if you know Jesus Christ, you will confess. Not you will, you must. When's the last time it just came out? I know Jesus. You're in an awkward family situation. I know Jesus. You're in a tough work situation. But I know Jesus. You have to. The lady could not just slink away from the crowd and say nothing. She came and she told Jesus everything. Are you thankful that Jesus saved you from your sins? Do you know that Jesus saved you from your sins? If you do, then what else can you do but tell everybody that Jesus Christ is alive and has saved you from your sins? She did. And you will. It's the best I can do out of the text. I can do no more. The great uh, hymn writer Hart says, Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, imagine if the lady just said, "Uh, maybe the doctors will help me a little bit more. Well, she had no money and probably wasn't going to get free service. Probably no Medicaid, so she was probably in trouble. If you tarry till you're better. Some of you are trying to get better. You're trying to get better. You can't get better. You're having an issue of blood for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There's no cure. The doctors can't help you. The psychiatrist can't help you. The husband can't help you. The pastor can't help you. The church can't help you. Nobody can help you. He can help you. Come to Jesus. If you tarry till you're better, you'll never come at all. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitless fitness fondly dream. Well, someday I'll be fit to come to Jesus. Remember what I said. You're never fit to come to Jesus. It's not your fitness that matters. It's his fitness. Nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. Am I talking to anybody here this morning? Am I talking to somebody who really has never really ever come to Jesus Christ? Everybody thinks you have, but you haven't. You know it. Why are all people talking about Jesus all the time? Because we love him, and that's all I've got to talk about. That's all I know. You ask, that, you ask yourself that question. Can't wait to get out the back door. Get away from these religious people. Are you that person? Or perhaps you are the one of the faltering faith. And you've looked inside and said, I just don't know if I believed or not. Oh, my beloved friend, have you touched Jesus' garment? Yes, I have. Do you believe that he died and was buried and rose again the third day? Yes, I believe. You're a believer. Will you stop looking at yourself? You'll see nothing in there but inconsistency and sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. I go back to my initial question. What does Jesus Christ stop for? If he was wandering up and down the church aisles, and I believe he is by his spirit right now, what would make him stop? The desperate soul that wants to be healed and will touch the garment of Jesus Christ by faith. Have you done that today? Please, don't walk out of here. I'll be over there. A couple of elders will be up front. If You can get saved right in your seat, by the way. You don't need me. If you want to talk, I'll talk. I'm sure the elders would love to talk with you. Jesus Christ stops, stops for desperate sinners to touch the hem of his garment by faith. Let's pray. Father, 
I'm not that smart. But the gospel is so clear. It's so clear. It doesn't want us to become scholars. We don't have to be Augustine or Spurgeon or anybody. We just have to be desperate enough to come to the Son of God, who even to this day in America 2021 is still offering himself to hopeless, weak, bleeding, unclean sinners. Oh, Lord, may we all come to him today, even if we've been saved for 50 years, or come to him today if we've never been saved before. Lord, please save us all, because Jesus is sufficient. We love you. We thank you. Amen.